Hurts, let's give it up. Man, can we welcome our South Shore campus? Man, guys, we love you over there. And also, man, don't we have an awesome pastor in Pastor Greg and Pastor Tamara? Can we give it up for them? I mean, come on, Cross the Church, can we give it up for our leaders? Now, I'm not just saying that because he's my boss. Um, really and truly, I can speak for Pastor Greg and the impact that he has had in my life. And I think I owe more to him and how God has used him to shape who I'm trying to be in this season of my life than almost any other pastor to this point that I've met. So, man, I love you, Pastor Greg. Man, I honor you. You are, to me, one of the greatest pastors I've ever met in my life. Thank you. Now, guys, if you don't know who I am, my name is Pastor Richard Toussaint. I am the young adult pastor here at the Crossing Church. Any young adults in the house? Amen. Ten of you. I know it's 845. It's kind of early. In the name of Jesus, yes. So I um, want to introduce you to my family. Right here on the screen, you'll see some beautiful people. And I'm not looking at the one on the left. He's all right. But the one on the right, oh, go back, 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 go back. That lady right there on the right, that Proverbs 31 woman in the name of Jesus, the good woman that I found. See, y'all. You got you to gotta bear with me. If I keep looking at that picture, I'll never preach today. But, um, man, the most phenomenal family. And also, I want to show you a picture of my son at Christmas. And, see, we did something to our son this year that we will keep doing until we can no longer get away with it. You see, my son has so much toys that we decided not to buy him new ones. So we kind of rewrapped the old ones. And I go back, go back, go back. Put it back up. So we put it back under the tree because right now in his life, he's more excited about the paper than he is about the present. So we said, until we're able to get away from that, we don't want our money to be funny, right? So until we're able to get away from that, his tree would always be packed with presents in the name of Jesus, even though he's played with them all year. Now, <laughs> he did unpack a present that I found that I thought was extremely interesting, though. And he was playing with it, and while he was playing with it, the Lord began to speak to me about it. So I did what every good father would do when the Lord is speaking to him about a toy that his son has. I took it from him. <laughs> and immediately he begins to cry out, mine, mine. And then I wanted to give him a theology lesson on ownership. Like, hey, the earth is the Lord's, but you are mine, okay? So, but I didn't do that. So he's screaming out, and the Lord gave me a lesson. And guys, 2018 is coming about, and I don't know about you, but did anybody have a rough time in 2017, right? Did some things go kind of turbulent for you in 2017? And man, you're expecting 2018 to be great, but there's this anxiety, this anxiousness in your heart that you know shouldn't be there. And you're just praying that God does something for you before this transition happens by the strike of dawn tomorrow morning. And this is how the Lord wanted me to start this message off. I didn't want to be extremely preachy. I, I kind of want to be vulnerable with you. And with the young adults, we have something that I always tell them, and it's a simple statement, and it's, here it is. Don't judge me. All right? You guys promise not to judge me? So I'm sitting there, and my son is playing with this toy. And as he's playing with this toy, the Lord told me to grab it, and you know, it was this amazing thing. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen this before. And the Lord asked me a question. Here's the question he asked me. He says, hey, Richard, has anyone placed any labels on you in 2017? Did anybody put any restrictions on you in 2017? Did anybody tell you that you weren't able to do something, that you weren't able to accomplish something? And he said, let's take it even a step further. Did you put any restrictions on yourself in 2017? Were there some things that you convinced yourself that you were not able to do or that you were not able to accomplish in 2017? I said, Lord, absolutely. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it down on this tablet of yours. So here's my transparent moment. I, I took it and I can hear my son upstairs screaming, mine, mine, mine. And I'm like, go somewhere, right? So I took the tablet and I began to write some things down. 
And I said, Lord, sometimes throughout the year, and there were moments, there were seasons, there were transitions that I believed that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't able enough to do the things that I believe I needed to do. And God said, Richard, I want to reveal something about you to you. That when you are in my presence, you are always good enough. So here's what I want you to do with that statement. I want you to wipe it away. And the Lord said, the amazing thing about this pad is no matter what you write on it, no matter how much you doodle and you mess up, you can just erase it. And God says, no matter what people say about you and no matter who you think you are, in my presence, I will erase all the things that is not lined up to who I say you are. So it is with this revelation that I come to you today and I ask you, has anyone placed any labels on you? Has anyone told you that you were not able to do something? Has anybody restricted you? Have you restricted yourself? I am asking you today to grab this tablet that somebody blessed my son with in the name of Jesus, to grab a tablet like this on your heart, and I want you to begin to write those things down, but I want you to see the amazing grace that God has bestowed in our lives that in his presence, when we find out who he is, it's wiped away. So the text that we have today is going to show us one amazing thing, that when you realize who who he is, who God is, you will recognize who you are. If you have your Bibles, if you have your iPads, if you have your iPhones, if you have your Androids, which we rebuke in the name of Jesus, if you have your eyeballs, you can look to the screen, and we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 11 through 18. And here read God's most holy word. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples a question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah and one of the prophets. Notice here that Jesus didn't argue with what people said that he is, but he is more interested in who his followers said that he is. Then Jesus replied, But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Let's pray together. Father God, help. Amen. All right. So majority of the time, who we are and who we per se, who we are and who we think we are normally isn't the same person. This reminds me of a story from um, about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali's traveling on an airplane. And flight takes off. They're about 30,000 feet, and the flight falls into some turbulence. So the stewardess comes to Muhammad Ali and says, excuse me, sir, um, would you mind putting on your seatbelt? To which Muhammad Ali turns back to the stewardess and says, hey, do you know who I am? I don't need a seatbelt. I'm Superman. To which she turns back to Muhammad Ali and says, yes, but Superman don't need a plane either. You see, sometimes who we are and who we think we are are two completely different stories. Now, in this story, there are about 13 people in the cast of this story. However, the conversation happens with two individuals. Now, we shouldn't surprise us that Jesus and Peter are having a conversation because if you read the Bible often or if you've ever heard of some things about the story of Jesus, you know that Peter is always a disciple that's speaking out whenever Jesus is having a conversation. But I had a problem with this text. If I can just be transparent with you, I want to have a conversation about my dialogue with, with God when I read this text. Peter discovered one of the most amazing transformation ever in Scripture. And what Jesus said after Peter became the rock of the Christian faith and even our church. But I had one problem with this. I said, Lord, why did you choose Peter? Why was it Peter that received this grand revelation? I mean, why couldn't it have been John? 
I mean, he's the disciple that you said that you love. Why couldn't it have been Andrew? Matter of fact, you said about Andrew that of all the disciples, no one has the amount of faith that Andrew has. Matter of fact, Lord, why couldn't it have been Matthias, you know, the, the guy who would eventually take Judas's place? I'm thinking this would have been a great place to implement Matthias, you know, kind of interweave him into the story. Why did it have to be Peter? And here's my problem with Peter. Peter is seen in Scripture to be loud, arrogant, boastful, a liar. Peter is seen to be half-naked fishing. I mean, the guy just strips down all his clothes and goes out fishing. Peter is not the, the picture that you have of decency and order. Peter is not the one who is poised and ready to receive a word. Peter is not the one that you envision that you will go out and do amazing things with. Peter is a friend that says, ready, shoot, fire. Like, Peter is the one who doesn't aim before he shoots. He just does stuff. So I'm like, why choose Peter? Then the Lord reveals something to me. You don't have to be perfect to receive a revelation from God. And he said, Richard, if, if you were perfect, if you think you're perfect, you're mistaken. And he says, if perfection was the key to receiving a revelation, do you think you would receive any revelation? To that piece, I said, absolutely not. So he said, hey, I want you to look at something. Instead of looking at the mishaps of Peter, look at the Messiah that was next to him. He said, instead of looking at the mess-ups for Peter, look at the messages that happened because of the mess-ups. He said, hey, instead of looking at the crisis, look at the Christ who was next to Peter. And I'm here to encourage somebody today that, hey, instead of looking at your mess-ups, how about we look at the messages that it created? Instead of the crisis in your life, how about we begin to look at the Christ who is right next to it? Matter of fact, let's do that for a second. In the book of Matthew chapter 14, there is a story about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a Savior that feeds me, right? I mean, I really mean food. Like, I'm not talking spiritual. I really mean, like, food. I love Jesus because wherever he is, there's food. Feeds the 5,000, fed 3,000, feed 2,000. I mean, he's always eating food, so I love him, right? I'm, I'm built for food, if you can't tell. So he feeds 5,000, and after he feeds them, he dismisses his disciples. And Jesus retreats to this place to pray. He tells his disciples, hey, go ahead without me. And Jesus being who he is, his prayer meeting runs a little long. So Jesus comes out of prayer and he has one little problem. His ride has left him. So Jesus does what only Jesus could do. He decides to walk on water to meet his ride. So here comes Jesus swag surfing on water, right? And he's approaching his disciples, but his disciples are in the middle of a storm. And there's waves, and there's wind, and there's a lot of things going on. And then all of a sudden they see him and they say, wait a minute, it's a ghost. Jesus says, no, guys, calm down. It's not a ghost. It's just me. So then this disciple, guess who said something? Brother Peter, this disciple decided to say, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. So Jesus says, okay, I'll, I'll humor you. Come. So Peter begins to step out on the water, and he puts one foot down, and he realizes that it's solid. And then he puts another foot down, and for the first time in history, we have somebody other than God walking on water. And I can imagine that Peter is sitting there, na, 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 boo, boo, you guys didn't do this. So he is walking on water, and Peter's eyes are on Jesus, and he's like, oh, man, this is good. I can imagine him start doing a little dance. He's like, hey, I'm dancing on water. And he's going, and he's doing his thing. And all of a sudden, Peter realizes something. I'm not supposed to be walking on water. And he looks around him, and the waves and the wind starts to distract him, so he takes his eyes off of Jesus. Now, my dear, ask you this. Have you ever been in the place in your life where God puts you someplace that you know you didn't put yourself? And in the midst of you being in that place, you realize that you're not supposed to be there. But instead of focusing on the one who brought you there, you begin to look at your surroundings. And then you try to manifest in your own self the way how you should be able to walk on water. And immediately, look what happened to Peter. He began to sink. And now everyone knows the story. Peter, you sank. Oh, you have little faith. But God said, look what happened directly after he sank. What happened? Peter cried out, Jesus, save me. And immediately God reached out his hands and saved him. 
And he says, hey, did, did you see the Savior while he was sinking? Did you see that the Savior was there while he was sinking? Did you see the message in the middle of the mess? That Jesus is glory over the elements, that Jesus is able to save. That was the first time Peter cried out to God to save him, but it would not be the last. And I'm asking you, who do you call to when you need saving? What's the name that you cry out? Man, I remember I was here with my son one evening, and we were out back right behind the stage, and being a pastor's son, he's in church a little bit longer than most kids are. So he's back there entertaining himself, and he's playing, and and he's dancing, and he's running around, and he's having a jolly old time. But here's something that you know about kids. They play well in the light, but sometimes they get afraid in the dark. So we were leaving the building, and we opened the back door, and there were no lights on as we exited the building. So I'm thinking that my son is going to begin to cry or be afraid. So he comes up next to me. He taps me on my leg, and he lifts his hands up. And I grab his hands and I begin to walk with him. And the Lord said, the reason why your son was not fearful of the dark is because he believed the one who was walking with him was greater than what he feared. Now, here's the thing. The reason why Peter was able to cry out to God to save him is because he believed that what was going on around him, Jesus was able to overcome it, which was death and fear. And God is teaching him, and I am Lord over death, and I am Lord over fear in your life. Church, do you believe this? Now, it makes sense to me why the psalmist would say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Here's the key verse. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not do what? Fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. Why am I able not to fear? Because the one who I walk with is able and is greater than the darkness that I'm walking through. So Peter is learning this, and Peter is identifying this. And instead of a mess up, I said, Lord, forgive me. Man, there's a message in there. So in 2018, when when the storms hit me, I can look for the Messiah with his hands stretched out. When my eyes fail and come off Jesus, I I can recenter myself on the rock who who shall not be moved. I remember the old folks in the church used to sing, We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy name. He never failed me yet. The next lesson that Peter had to learn come at a great cost to his pride. This one was in Luke chapter 22. And Peter is identifying that when he realized who God is, he'll recognize who he is. But in this process, here's what's about to happen. Jesus comes down from the Last Supper. Again, food. I love it, right? So Jesus comes down from his feeding of the Last Supper, and Jesus knows that he's about to die. So Jesus begins to have a conversation with his disciple. Now, let's pause here parenthetically. I am the young adult pastor, but I also share roles as the part of the pastoral care team here. And over the year, I've had the privilege to share in marriages, but I've also had the opportunity to do funerals. I've had the opportunity to go to hospitals while individuals were having their last breath. And I tell you this, when somebody is on their dying bed, their deathbed, the last few words that they utter are very important because they realize that death is certain. And they realize that whatever they say, it has to be important. It's a culmination of everything that they know. And there is a message that they want you to hear. So they craft it very carefully. It's not with loose words. They craft it with intention and they give it to you. So that's the context that I want you to listen to this where Jesus is about to die. So Jesus comes down. He looks at his disciples and Jesus turns around and he looks at Peter. And he says, Peter... The devil has demanded to have you. Immediately to the question again, I ask, why Peter? Why Peter? I'll share that with you in a second. The devil has demanded to have you. He wants to sift you out like weed. He wants to suck the life out of you. Anybody ever felt that before? 
You feel like something just wants to suck everything out of your life. But look at what Jesus said. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have been strengthened, go and strengthen the others. You would think this will be a deep moment to where you're like, yes, Lord, I received that word. But nah, not Brother Peter. Oh, no, 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 no. Brother Peter looks back to Jesus and says, hey, Lord, man, it doesn't matter what happens, man, I will never betray you. Peter. Peter, before, before the rooster crows three times, you will betray me tonight. Whoa, Jesus. Slow your roll, buddy. I know you think you're all-knowing, but hey, they may betray you, but I will never betray you. Anybody here who believes they know more than Jesus sometimes? The Lord is telling you something, you're like, oh, yeah, whatever, Lord. It's not how it really works, right? So Peter is telling Jesus that he will never betray him. And the Lord showed me something very interesting in this text, right? I said, Lord, something happened with betrayal. There were two individuals who betrayed you. There was Judas, and then there was Peter. Why was it that when Judas betrayed you, he killed himself. And then when Peter betrayed you, he was restored. What was the reason? Well, it's two things. Number one, Jesus prayed for Peter. And then the second thing is, Peter's identity was found in Christ. Judas' identity was wrapped up in himself. And Jesus showed me this interesting dichotomy that he says, hey, in order for you to betray me, look at what happened. Difficulty must first be the trigger. So when, the, when they came to get Jesus, immediately the disciples began to be dispersed. That represents difficulty. And then the text says that Peter was afraid, so he followed Jesus from a distance. That's the second thing. There's difficulty, and then there's distance. And immediately while he was afar off from Jesus, where he wasn't in the proximity to be held accountable, he denied Jesus. So the Bible says, hey, there are three things that happens in your life in order for you to betray Jesus. There's difficulty, there's distance, and then there's denial. So Peter denies Jesus, but how does Jesus respond to Peter? Jesus, in the middle of knowing Peter is going to deny him, the first thing he tells him while he was giving him his prophecy is, hey, I have prayed for you. Peter, I am not holding it against you. I believe in you. He's telling Peter, hey, I love you. You are cherished. You are my son. And here is the things, man. We all have disappointments that we feel that, we have, that we've let God down at times. And God is looking at us and saying, hey, man, I have prayed for you. I am not holding this against you. Well, pastor, how do you know this? Because after Jesus has been resurrected, look at the first encounter he has with Peter. He finds him fishing. Peter is naked to half naked, puts some clothes on, jumps in the water. He swims to Jesus. And here is the first thing Jesus tells him. Let's eat. My type of God. Let's eat. Peter, go grab the fish that you just have, that you just caught, and let's sit around the fire and let's eat. He didn't say, Peter, how could you do this to me? Peter, after all the things that I've done for you, why did you deny me? Peter, I can't believe this. He didn't give a pity party. He said, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Instead of reprimanding him, he gives him another job. He gives him another chance. And that is a message that God is speaking to him. When you are found in my presence, a mess up doesn't mean that you're gone. When you're a part of my kingdom, a slip up doesn't mean that you're fired. What it means is it gives you another opportunity to show my glory in your life. And God is saying you can only get there when you're wrapped up in my identity. So Peter does this and before I jump into that, I have to share with you the most amazing story of somebody I know having an identity of Christ, and going through something well. One of my best friends, his name is Keaton Brown. Keaton Brown had a beautiful baby boy. And as soon as his child was born, man, I rushed to the hospital to see his baby boy. And when I saw him, I thought he was gorgeous. I'm like, brother, this is a good-looking kid. So I told him the same thing he told me. Your child is so good-looking, I know that he got his looks from his mom, right? So we were over there, and we're picking the kid up, and we're, ah, Savannah, I'm going to go from T-Bob. So we're doing, like, Lion King things in the hospital, and we're having a trip, and we're doing all the things that dad secretly wants to do but can't do because mom is there. So we're having a fun time. 
Well, then the end of the week, he takes his baby home. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, bro, my baby passed away in the middle of the night. Immediately, I rushed over to his house. There's spontaneous crying. Brief moments of smiling. Back to erratic moments of tears again. Fast forward to the funeral, man. His wife is weeping tremendously. It comes time for the moment for him to tell everybody, thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of the life. And Keaton stands up and he begins to say something that I will never forget till the day I die. He says, it isn't until you go through tragedies that you find out what you believe about God and his promises. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have never known that the Lord could save you from a fiery furnace if they weren't thrown into the fire. He said, Daniel would have never known that the Lord could shut the mouths of lions if he wasn't thrown into the lion's den. He says, so the question that we're asking is not, why did this happen? Oh, no, the question that we're asking is, what am I to do with this? Because my God is faithful and my God is love. That is the resolve of somebody who has found their identity in Christ. So Peter responds to Jesus when Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up for the group and says, you are the Messiah. You are Jesus, the living son of God. That's the proclamation that was made. Now, in the response, there's two parts. It's what Peter said, but then there's also what Jesus said. Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jodah. Blessed are you, Simon. Now, in the text, there is something interesting that happens. His name goes from Simon, and then in the next verse, he says, you, are Peter. There is a name change there. And the reason why the name changes, Peter means rock. Now, Jesus is looking at Peter and said, Peter, people look at you and they see a mess up. People look at you and they see somebody loud, somebody arrogant, somebody boastful, somebody who thinks so much of himself. But I look at you and I see a rock. And God is saying, I see you the way how you ought to be. And in my presence, I elevate you to who you can be and who you are. And there is somebody here that the Lord is saying, you need to get into my presence because what others say about you is not who you really are. I see you as a rock when they see you as flimsy. And he says, Peter... Upon this confession that you have made that I am Christ, I am going to build my church on this. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I am going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Yo, Peter gets a promotion. Peter gets a place in God's kingdom. And Peter gets power. And that's what happens when you're in the presence of God. You get promotion. You get a place in his kingdom, and you get power. But there's also a promise. He said the gates of hell would not prevail against you. Now, that means there's two things that are about to happen. You're about to receive satanic assault. But by God, the satanic assault will not be successful. And that is something that you need to know. So here comes Peter. And he's in this place, and he just received this prophecy. And guys, can we just fast forward a little bit in the life of Peter? When he says that you are the rock, do you know that later on in Peter's life, Peter is going to be imprisoned. And when he's imprisoned in Rome, Peter is going to pen the book of 2 Peter. And here's what's going on in the book of 2 Peter. Peter realizes that he's about to die. But instead of denying Christ this time, what does he do? He feeds his sheep. Did you see the message in the mess? Did you see that everything that you've gone through in life leads up to a point to where you can glorify God? In the book of 2 Peter, it was amazing what's going on. The people did not believe that Christ would return. They did not believe that Jesus was coming back, so they began to live the old life that they used to live. So Peter took this opportunity on his deathbed to say, hey, guys, I saw Jesus. He picked me out of the water. I was there when the the dove came down and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I heard the voice with my own two ears. And he says, hey, guys, I don't want you to get weary in doing well. I, I don't want you to give up hope looking for Jesus for a day with the Lord is as a thousand, a thousand as a day. He's not taking his time because he's doing something else. He's taking his time so more people can get to know him. And I want you to know this Jesus. 
And Peter was saying, hey, on my deathbed, guys, I've been through some things in life. I've made some mess ups. Hey, don't be arrogant. I'm like, wait, the arrogant one is now teaching lessons on humility? Do you see the mess that turned into a message? The one who was sinking is now talking about the Savior? Do you see the how when your identity changes, everything is found in Christ? The amazing thing is now the place where Jesus was at was Caesarea Philippi, and there was an amazing statue of Caesar that was built there. 2,000 years later, when people go to Rome, they're not talking about where was Caesar buried. They're asking, where was Peter buried? Where was Paul buried? Where did Jesus walk? Where, where did Paul walk? Where, where did Peter walk? The things that were fortune and fame at that time now is no more. But what lasted was God and his disciples. And Jesus is saying the worldly pleasures that you have now is going to fade away and what's going to last is me and what you do for me. I am the one who turns your trials into triumphs. I am the one who picks you up when you are falling. Who am I to you? Am I the son of God? Am I the Messiah? And I'm asking you today, church, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? You can go into 2017. You can go into 2018 with a plan. But you better go in there with a promise from God. You can go into 2018 with, with purpose. But it better not be for your own profit. You need your identity to be found in Christ. So as I close, I, I ask you this question. Who do you say God is? Is your identity found in Christ? What labels have you placed on yourself? What's writing, what's being written on the tapestry of your hearts? And does God need to come in and take them away? I want you to repeat something after me. I want you to say, God, who am I? Let's ask that question one more time. God, who am I? Can we do something weird for a little bit? Can we give about a little 10-second pause to, to give the Lord room to answer that question that you just asked them? Let's pause for a second. God, I pray that you answer that question to everyone who spoke those words. Whether they're watching online, whether they're in the bathrobe, whether they're across the seas fighting for our country, whether they're in the room, Lord, whether they're over there at South Shore right now, answer that question. And here's the next thing. Peter had a revelation of Jesus Christ, and I want to tell you this one practical way. How do you receive a revelation from God that surpasses human understanding? It's right here in the text. You have to be present in God's presence. Peter received the revelation because he was in the presence of God. All of Peter's mishaps were cleaned up because he was in the presence of God. In order for you to move forward in life and do anything, in order for you to receive the revelation from God, you have to be in his presence. But the only way to do that is to accept him as your savior. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And it's not the prayer that saves you, but the belief in the one that you're praying to. So guys, as you're asking God, who am I? Let's first make sure that our soul is steadfast on the rock that cannot be moved. Say this prayer after me. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Save me. I am yours. Amen. Now, guys, if you said that prayer for the first time and you meant it, I'm going to ask you to do something so bold. We want to celebrate with you. On the count of three, I want you to stand to your feet signifying that you've just transferred the deed of your life over to Christ. On the count of three, one, two, three, stand to your feet if you just accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I see you over there in the name of Jesus. I see you. Is there anybody else? I see you. That's you. Stand to your feet right now. In the name of God, man, I invite you. Would you mind coming down to the front? Come on down here. Man, I want to hug you guys. I want to shake your hand. I want to welcome you to the family. If there's anyone else, I'm asking that you stand and come. 
Come on down. What an amazing time. Crossing Church, can we welcome them into the family of God? Man, welcome. Welcome. As our prayer partners are coming, our prayer partners are about to give you a Bible, and they're going to be praying with you guys. And I want to tell you, man, welcome to the family. The decision that you have made is the most important thing you can ever do. And God is going to begin to give you a new name and a new purpose. And he's going to begin to write what he has for you on your heart. And once he writes it down, it will never be erased. Amen. Now, guys, we're about to go into 2018. We're about to go to 2018, but I want to challenge you to do something. Before 2018 hits, does anybody here want to know what God has in store for them and what God demands of them for 2018? So guys, I'm going to ask you to respond in a radical way. Now, this isn't for my benefit. I'm really pleading with you because when I did this in my prayer time, the Lord revealed some wonderful things to me. But it only happens, again, in the presence of God through prayer. So what I'm asking, Pastor John is about to sing a song. And this song is going to be your invitation to come down to the altar. Now, when you come down to the altar, here's why I'm asking you to come down to the altar. Because the altar is a place where God speaks. Now, he speaks everywhere. Don't get it wrong. But throughout Scripture, the altar has been a place where God has met his people and done phenomenal things for them. Guys, I'm inviting you to come down to the altar. And I want you to ask God, if you need a new identity, Lord, who do you say that I am? The same question that he asked, I want you to ask back to God. Who do you say that I am? And allow him to write that in your heart. If you're lost, if you're, if you're wondering, what's my purpose? What am I to do in 2018? Lord, what is it that you have for me? I've kind of lost my way. I, I need to get back on track. I'm inviting you to come down and hear what God has to say. Amen? Come on, church. Let's do that together. May the Lord bless you and be with you. In the name of our Father, our Lord, and our Savior.